Aloha, I'm Chad Blair. Thank you for watching GMO Week on Alelo. From an island perspective, it's essential to ask about the impact of GMOs on our environment, lands, and resources, and to understand the effects it has on our community as it relates to public policy. But let's face it, many of us don't know where to begin when it comes to such a complex issue. And that's why we bring to you GMO Week, a series of programs to help explore and explain the pros and cons of genetically modified organisms, GMO. If you visit alelo.org slash GMO, you'll be able to watch on demand discussions with both pro and anti-GMO views, as well as tune in live for a GMO debate and even participate in the discussion by tweeting your questions to hashtag AlelloGMO. In this program, which is the second of two half-hour segments, we'll learn how to bridge the divide between pro and anti-GMO. And now, a video presented by our panelist. Agricultural biotechnology is a powerful technology in terms of applying science to solving real-world important problems that affect all of us day to day. I am a plant pathologist. I feel it's my job to try to figure out how to control diseases, and I specialize in viruses. The uh, papaya ring spot virus is the most prevalent virus that infects papaya worldwide. And this uh, virus actually was in Hawaii since 1945. It uh, destroyed uh, much of the papaya industry in Oahu. Then in uh, 1992, it entered the uh, Puna district where they raised 95% of the papaya. The fruit gets all gnarly and, and shrunken. It reduces the production of the fruit on the tree, and that's why it causes severe damage. And when you are depending upon that for your income and your family's income, um, you know, many of us cried. The system then was, if you don't want it to infect all your trees, you chop down your trees. And that worked for a while, but the virus has kept on spreading. There was a point there where we, instead of harvesting a million pounds a year, we're down to a couple thousand pounds a year. By 1998, the production of papaya in Pune had gone down 50%. So the impact of the virus was severe. If not for biotechnology, Hawaii's papaya industry would have been nearly destroyed. The uh, story behind the uh, genetically engineered or the rainbow papaya is it represents a case in which scientists and the industry work together. It was just like immunization. One could almost vaccinate uh, papaya and it'll make it resistant. By 1991, we had some small uh, papaya seeds that were genetically engineered or transformed. So we put a field trial out in Rusty Paris Farm. Many of the growers came to look at this field trial. For our farmers, seeing was believing said, okay, this is really good. The genetically engineered papaya was growing beautiful. The non-genetically engineered was all infected. Oh my gosh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. For us, there was no question. As soon as this commercial seed was going to be available, we were going to plant it. In uh, 2009, genetically engineered papaya makes up about 80% of Hawaii's papaya production. I think the short answer to what ag biotech did to the papaya industry is it really saved it. So let's continue where we left off. We were talking about health and the long-term safety issue of GMOs over the long run. One of the criticisms that we hear about GMOs is that maybe there's not enough studies done on how that might affect the human body over the long term. And Adolf, I wonder if I might ask you to comment on that. Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, there's been trillions of servings of GMO food. Uh, and not one incident, incident of any health effects. This is ever, trillions with a T, right? Yes, <laughs> ever occurring that's directly related to somebody consuming a GMO uh, food. Uh, another important thing is we have to look at the, the multitude of credible science behind uh, the fact that uh, GMO foods are safe 
And when you look at the credible uh, science uh, research and people weighing in on that, you got to look at the uh, American Medical Association. You got to look at the well, uh, World Health Organization. These are these are people who help set standards in in health uh, in everything that we do. So uh, I, I I think looking at people who have the expertise, the knowledge, and the credibility to determine uh, safety standards for food is first and foremost, we gotta recognize uh, uh, the science behind it and the evidence behind it that it's, it, it is safe. Now are these isolated studies or are there studies that have been conducted year after year uh, to see how the effects are on the human body, on the elements over a period of time? Well, at, at, at this point, we, we rely on those evidence that are replicated. These are studies that are duplicated, science research that are duplicated that help to support uh, the research behind uh, the safe consumption of GMOs. Uh, over, you know, we've been consuming GMOs uh, close to 20 years. And again, I go back to the evidence that there's no document uh, issue behind the consumption of GMO food. Some might argue that 20 years is not a long time and that something else may show up uh, 10 years from now and so forth. Dennis, I know this is a topic that you're familiar with. Yeah, 20 years is a long time, but you can't say what's gonna happen uh, five years. Well, I, I think that's with anything. We really don't know what's gonna happen too much in the future, so you go with your best shot. In science, uh, with the uh, genetically engineered papaya, we studied the nutrition of the non-GMO, GMO found that it was safe, the level of potential toxins, we studied the allergenicity of the transgene, have published all of these things, but we've not done animal feeding. Now, interestingly, in Japan, which is, everybody sees that as a very stringent country, we recently deregulated the papaya in Japan, and, and they never, uh, ask us to do any uh, animal feeding studies. So you, you got to rely on, on on the science that you do and what's going to happen down in the future. Nobody knows, but you do the best that you can what you have now. And uh, we've sold over what uh, 400 million pounds of genetically engineered papaya, and like Adolf says, uh, no no ill effects. Now, government makes mistakes, uh, scientists make <coughs> mistakes. Um, I bring up the example, perhaps not an analogy that's perfect, but tobacco uh, consumed widely in this country. It wasn't until, what, the 50s or 60s that we started having labeling. I think it was up into the 1980s where you could smoke on an airplane and then suddenly, remember that? You'd be sitting in the non-smoking section and yet you could smell the smoke behind it. Again, perhaps not the best example, but what about the argument that government makes mistakes? Science makes mistakes. 20 years really is not enough time uh, and therefore to have, uh, have this available on the market so freely is a bit risky. Well, uh, I'm not uh, sure uh, how, we, how you would say 20 years is not enough time. Now, you can talk about the tobacco, but the tobacco case was evidence began to build up. So the government uh, sees that, then they begin to change the laws. Now, I would say with the GMO papaya, if after so many years certain incidents were be beginning to happen, naturally they should go back and look at, but nothing's happening, you know, how can you say, you know, it, it's, you got to go 20, 30 years? There, there, I see no rationale for that. There's, you know, there's, you, you got cell phones out there. Nobody's saying anything about the radiation, the radiation brain. might be, you know, <laughs> and I mean, to me, that might be worse than, than eating GMO products because, and then I also hear people about, oh, you know, um, when we cut out the GMO products from my diet, um, my health improves. But if you think about it, what are, what are, what are the products that, are, that they're cutting out from their diet? It's meat, maybe consuming less meat products, stuff like that, and you know what? Yeah, and eating, eating more vegetables. Yeah, that's gonna improve your health, period. Right, so, you know, I mean, everything in moderation to me, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's the model that I live by, that I don't eat meat seven days a week, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that, but, you know, you got to balance everything, and I think that's what what people forget about. Yeah, and, and to add add to the argument is the fact that, you know, if I'm very passionate about what I consume, 
it's easy for me to go to a market and say, I want non-GMO, I want organic. And that settles it. There's no issue behind what I'm putting in my mouth. So, you know. It's a choice, really. It's, it, it really is a choice, yeah. So, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm at the belief that every individual has the opportunity to make those choices. And those choices are pretty black and white. They're, they're straightforward. You want a non-GMO product, you go to the store and ask for a non-GMO product, it's labeled. You want an organic product, you go to the store and ask for a organic products that labeled. Now, um, there is labeling, but there is some question as to how much labeling there should be. There was a push in the legislature this past session, unsuccessful, to label products more clearly that contain GMO and so forth. It's a big battle. It may come up again next session. Why is labeling not a good idea? What what do you oppose about that? And Dean, I think I, I know you were down there at the legislature testifying on yeah, this. I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad idea on a federal level. It's at the USDA that should be doing the labeling. And the reason why is, okay, when you think about labeling, you're gonna have to vet every product. Okay, if, if, if I say that I have corn, corn inside my thing, I mean, that product is gonna have to be tested. You're gonna have to have systems set up to monitor all of this. If you're going to do it at the state level and you're going to go um, the state of Hawaii, 1.4 million people, you're going to tell Kellogg, oh, I, want, I want a label on that cereal um, for, for what's in it. If it's GMO, I, I want it. And then they're going to have to test it. And how do you do that? Cost effectively monitor this stuff at the state level. Hmm. It's not. So what I'm saying is... It, the costs are just exorbitant on a state level to do this because and it's not the cost of the label, it's the monitoring, it's the setting up the system of checking who's telling the truth and who's not. If you're doing it on a federal level, okay, you're, you're spreading this out over hundreds of millions of people, okay, and these big companies will listen. Half of these companies, if you're going to tell them that at a state level, I'm looking at 1.4 million people in a, in a, in a in a, uh, out, of a, uh, out of hundreds of millions of people, I'm gonna, basically, my decision might even be, you know what, I don't need to send it mm -hmm. to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. I don't need that market because it's cost prohibitive. Yeah. I'll take my goods elsewhere. And, and who does that affect? It doesn't affect the people that can go out and buy organic. Mm -hmm. It affects those people on food stamps in Kalihi, in Waianae. Papaya, Dennis, on the Big Island, grown in Puna. Uh, forgive me, I'm a little naive about this. I've seen all the papaya trees and whatnot. I've seen it in the markets. Is there a labeling? Is there something that says this is rainbow papaya? It's been treated. Uh, the disease uh, that, that was afflicting it has been eradicated and whatnot. No, in the uh, in, in the KTA, for example, and on the Big Island, you know, they sell the papaya, and it's labeled rainbow. It's labeled so forth. So. And, and, and most everybody knows that rainbow papaya is genetically engineered, but it's not, for what I see, it's not labeled this is a GMO because I, I agree that the, is the federal government need to make that ruling as to whether it's labeled or not. And the FDA says that our genetically engineered papaya is equivalent to the non-genetically engineered so you don't have to label. On the other hand, we recently deregulated the papaya in Japan. And in Japan, you have to label. So I said, fine, no problem. We got a label, we'll label it. So it's the government decisions. And that, that's where I go by. The federal government makes the decision and you abide by it. Yeah, and, and sir, several things to, to bring up concerning labeling. And, you know, the question is posed about if we're, we know that the food is safe to eat. I'm talking about GMOs. Why don't we label it? A lot of times we're posed that question. And, you know, for, for me, uh, I look at that from this perspective, and the anti-GMO movement has done a good job in the fear they've been posed on the consumption of GMO for the past decade. I mean, it's all over. Don't eat it. It's Franken food, et cetera, et cetera. So why would anybody that grows a GMO crop, and I use the small papaya farmer, would enthusiastically raise their hand and say, label mine. I have no problem with that. But there's a, there's a strong public perception that that papaya that has that label is not good to eat. Mm. So for me, I think, again, I reiterate what Dennis and uh, Dean had said, that let's look to the food safety expert to tell us 
where to go with food labeling. You know, one more point in all of this is when you when you require the labeling, it, it really isn't the Monsantos or the Syngentas that it affects. It's from the small farmers because a farmer at the farm level is going to have to start labeling there. So who's incurring the cost? It's from the farm to the processor and so on down the line. But it's not the guys yeah. that are growing the and Chad, product. And Chad, to add, to add what uh, Dean is saying, unfortunately, we're not able to uh, see that resolution that was proposed to do a feasibility study. Yeah, there was a resolution and the Senate didn't make right. it through the House. It didn't make it to the House. You know, unfortunately, what that would have done, it would actually have put the horse before the cart. It would look at all aspects of labeling, the constitutionality aspect of it, uh, the cost uh, aspects of it. And, and so, really, uh, it's unfortunate, that, you know, for the state of Hawaii, you know, if they uh, really looked at it from, you know, the aspect of making sure the public had a good background information on what labeling entails, it would have been a lot better going into this session. We probably would have been able to work some kind of compromise with this whole labeling issue. One of the criticisms of the resolution, by the way, from the anti-GMO folks was, well, yeah, you're going to stack with all the pro-GMO folks. There was not enough of an anti-GMO voice uh, on that, uh, that panel that would have looked at uh, labeling and so forth. Well, I think, I think what's important, too, is that the anti-GMOs with, with their lawyers have prepared the measure to, to try to move through the House and through the Senate. When you really look at it, if they had dot their I's and crossed their T's, it would have made it. They did not. There were some flaws in, in, in the measure itself, and the constitutionality aspect was one of them. Right. So uh, really, if, if you are going to move any measure or bill through the legislative process, you got to do your homework. And my concern is really, let's put the horse before the cart. If we're really passionate and get plenty of aloha for what you believe in, then let's, let's do a feasibility study. Speaking of legislative process, uh, Big Island Hawaii County Council dealing with a proposal right now, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dennis, but the idea would to ban all GMO products uh, on the Big Island. Do I have that right? Yes, so in general, they want to make uh, Hawaii uh, GMO free, and they said that they wanted to, they, they would grandfather the papaya into it. But the way the bill was written, uh, you really could not raise a papaya under those conditions. But the, the most important thing is, it, it really made me sad because it's, that type of bill divides the people. And, and I, I looked at that bill and said, my, that, that's really sad because, you know, the papaya story is a story in which people did something to help the farmers, the industry, and where can you find a fruit? $4 for a dollar in a farmer's market. And that's only because it's available. People are benefiting. Old people like to eat papaya. You get rid of this. You uh, don't allow GMO papaya on the Big Island. The virus is going to come back. Now, a very important thing. I just came back from a biotech conference. I used to work at the University of Florida on citrus way back in the 70s. Florida used to raise a million acres of citrus. Now. They're under the threat of this greening disease that they're predicting in about four or five years it might wipe out the citrus industry. That's caused by a bacteria transmitted by a psyllid. That uh, disease has come into Texas, now it's in California. It could come into Hawaii. Mm. This disease is no respecter of citrus. I see in Hilo, Hawaii, and other places, they love to raise tangerines in the backyard. This disease comes into it, coming to Hawaii, is going to wipe out the tangerine. Now, the people in Florida now are saying, what is the best bet is genetic engineering. So all of these kind of bills that says no GMOs, I think it's divisive, and there's no need for that. We, we should just say, how can Hawaii be more sustainable, and have good discussions to figure out what we can do. We could talk about this for hours, and unfortunately there's only so much time that we have, but I'm hearing that word divisive several times over, the legislation, the protesters. There was a big march in Waikiki just a couple of weeks ago, the anti-GMO folks. 
What are your suggestions for bringing folks together of these two sides <coughs> and, and coming up with some sort of compromise and better understanding? And we don't have a lot of time, but I could ask each of you at the table your two cents on that, if you will. Well, I, I think there's opportunities to leverage knowledge and, and skills from one another. I think that's important. I think all farmers, whether you're practicing organic, conventional, or biotechnology, you know, the opportunity to come together to leverage where you can learn from one another to me is really important. And in, in, in order for us to be successful with food security, sustainability in Hawaii, all farmers got to work together. And I think that's the key. Uh, there's, there's, there's a strong divide. And I think in order to lift that divide, we have to bring the real farmers together, the, those that are actually farming to kind of understand the challenges and find ways to make things work that benefit the whole agriculture community. Molokai is a small island. Everybody knows everybody. Walter Ritty is from Molokai, probably one of the most prominent anti-GMO uh, uh, opponents out there. Um, you talk story with him. Are you guys able to communicate, or is it, uh, or do you have some tension there trying to well, relate well, on this issue? Well, you know, when you look at it from the context of what Walter is doing, he has, he has an agenda. And, you know, obviously he, he's taking a strong stand against the technology and the work that we do on Molokai. You know, what, what's clear and, and, and so people understand, we have a lot of example I'll use is Native Hawaiian local people working for the industry. In mm -hmm. fact, the company I work for, over 52% of our employees are Hawaiian. I believe Monsanto is over 50% too. So when you look at that in the context of what does that mean in connection with the broader community, that says a lot. So representation, you know, in terms of Walter advocating for what he speaks for, doesn't necessarily speak for the community. Okay. And to you, Dennis, uh, bridging yeah. that divide, finding some sort of yeah. a way to talk to each other. You know, um, I, I've been a scientist all my life until I recently retired, and I've seen the power of science. We all see the power of science. So the power of science. The, the power of science in, in developing cell phones and going to the moon and all of this stuff don't happen without science and research. But all of this stuff here in Hawaii, if there's any place in agriculture that we need good science is in agriculture. So my take is we, we need to really start to talk story, the organic, uh, talk story, say, okay, now, how can we better produce this crop without contamination? Or what? I'd be more than happy to help you. Uh, we need dialogue, but you're not going to get dialogue by saying we're going to eliminate all GMOs from the Big Island, for example. Okay, Dean, the uh, last word to you. Uh, absolutely, because, I mean, you know, to me, we need to grow our organic industry locally. You know, I mean, if we're not going to protect our borders, and to me, that should be the fight that all of us can join in to, to put up a facility out there that we check everything incoming because that's where the science, okay, I mean, to control all the insects we have here. The tomato industry is at risk again. In the last two years, we've had two diseases that are wiping them out. So now you don't see the vine-ripened tomatoes anymore, I mean, or, or very limited amounts now, again, and, and that's just going to get worse. So we as an industry need to understand that we can work, to, we need to work together to grow the whole industry as a whole. And I'm saying organic as well as conventional and as well as biotech. We can all support each other because all our other issues are land, cost of land, water, labor. All of these things are common in industry no matter what kind of agriculture you do. And we, you know, we, we can't even solve those problems. What are we talking about here? You know, what are we talking about banning an industry that can help us going forward mm -hmm. to grow the whole industry as a whole? And that's, that's what my goal is at some point, is to really bring back agriculture as a vital component in our economic, one of the major economic engines for our state going forward, also to bring in people that can partake in, in what we do here. In agriculture. Uh, just a, one last point on this. Uh, down there at the legislature, the, the opponents, you're kind of their poster child for the pro-GMO. A <laughs> lot of uh, unfortunate words back and forth, a lot of anger on both sides. Could you work with these folks as well and include them in, the, in that discussion with the industry? You know, I mean, I would try. 
I mean, honestly, I, I could try and work with any, anybody, but you know, some uh, truthfully, there are some people that you're not gonna you're not gonna change. I mean, I, Walter, by the way, I think the world of the guy as a person. I get along really well with, with Walter, and I, I have a lot of respect for him because we're trying to do the same thing. He's trying to help Hawaii. Bottom line, it's just in a different way. And um, but I have a, I, I I do respect them, you know. So yeah, people like that I could work with. Uh, people that have an agenda that's that's you know that's aimed at something you know maybe not. Okay, we won't name any names in that yeah. regard. It's a good place to stop. I'd like to thank our panelists Adolf and Dennis and Dean for sharing their views on GMO. Don't forget to visit alelo.org/gmo to watch both pro and anti GMO programs and to send in your questions for our live discussions. I don't have a stance on this issue, but I'm committed to being better informed and engaged. I hope you are too. This is Chad Blair for GMO Week. On behalf of Alelo Community Media, thanks for tuning in.